let's, um, let's open up with a prayer. Almighty God and everlasting Father, we give you thanks for bringing us and gathering us here once more in your name. And ask your blessing upon us as we study your word, that this would be a time um, of strengthening our faith in you and our love and service towards others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 All right, so we are in Acts chapter 10. Um, I did get the handout finished, so there's one um, over on the table over there. So last week we finished up chapter 9 and got into um, just the very beginning of chapter 10. So, just a, a reminder then, um, briefly covering this, at the end of chapter 9, we switch, um, we switch back away from Saul and over to Peter again, um, and we're going to be um, kind of following Peter around for the next few chapters here. And um, so, we had um, these different accounts here of the healing of Aeneas, um, a woman named Dorcas restored to life. And then um, Peter and Cornelius. And so now um, we get to um, this part on Peter's vision. Okay, a vision that he has. Um, this is a, uh, a kind of a, a well known, almost a Sunday school story type thing going through the book of Acts. Um, where Peter sees this vision of the different animals coming down, being lowered down from heaven, and, um, and God saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Right? So um, we're going to look a little bit at, um, at this account and what happened. So um, we're going to start with verse 9, um, Acts chapter 10, verse 9, and read, uh, to start off, just read through verse 16. Okay? Chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. Okay. So, it says, The next day, excuse me, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descended being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call common. Now this happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Okay. So, a couple of notes here as well. Um, uh, just from the previous section, the beginning of chapter 10, in that account of Peter and Cornelius. Um, Peter, um, Cornelius had had um, this vision. Remember, he's a, he's a Gentile, right? And so he's had, um, he's had this vision as well. And uh, he sends men to Joppa to bring Peter to him, right? Because he knows that Peter is over there in Joppa, and he's there because that's where he, Peter had just been, where he brought Dorcas, or Dorcas was brought back to life, right? So... Cornelius has this vision. He knows Peter, who Peter is, and he says, I'm going to send some men over to servants and a soldier, a devout soldier, in other words, a believer, um, over um, to try to find Peter. And they know right where he is, that he's with Simon a Tanner, and, um, and that kind of thing. So, these guys are on their way over, and as they're approaching the, the city, that's where we now jump over to what Peter's doing. It's about, um, he went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. So what time of the day is this? Noon. 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 Yeah. So it's noon. The ninth hour is three. Okay. So they're doing Roman. They're counting by the Roman um, hours of the day. So the day starts at 6 a.m. 
right, about the time of sunup. So that's, that's when the Roman day begins, okay? Whereas the Jewish day, um, they have two different things. One, they'd say the day began at sundown the night before, right? That's when Sunday turns into Monday. That's when the sun goes down, right? But then they're also counting from midnight. Uh, okay? So, you just have different ways of counting. Uh, we did the Ed Wings. We looked through some of that stuff before we got into Acts. For those of you who um, might have been here and remember. But we went through some of those different ways of counting the hours of the day. So, that's what this is. We're going by the Roman counting. Okay? The sixth hour of the day being noon. Last week, if you remember, we, um, right at the end, I said... Uh, we talked a little, just briefly, about how there are these traditional times, different times of the day, in which um, the Jews, as well as Christians, through most of history, would pray. Um, and, uh, and a little bit of an encouragement, if you can, to try to do that, right? Set an alarm on your phone, your watch, whatever it may be, to spend a couple of minutes praying um, throughout the day. It's a pretty, um, it's a good practice. That kind of thing. So, it's a practice that Peter did. So it's noon, he goes up onto the housetop, and this is pretty normal in this kind of the world as well. You go up there, the um, the top, you know, they all have these the flat roofs up there, and they go and they spend time up there. A lot of the times in the evening, um, it's cooler. They might have some kind of shade put up as well, or that kind of. Um, but this would have been a very, um, a very common practice. So he goes, and he's hungry. Well, it's lunchtime, right? So he's hungry. Um, he wants something to eat. Um, and while they, so other people are preparing the food for him, he fell into a trance, and then he has this vision. All right, it's interesting, I think, to note that... Um, this happens while he's hungry and while he's waiting for food, and he has this vision of food. Um, and so, I mean, there's questions that have been, you know, kind of arisen about this, right? I mean, is he just so hungry and he's out in the sun, he's kind of delirious and dreaming of food, right? Um, yeah. Um, I think our answer is, well, no, that's that's not why. Um, the next act of the Holy Spirit tells Peter to go meet the visitors, confirm, right, that this is a real thing. He's not just imagining it, he's not just hungry. But this is um, this is something that's real, that the Spirit is revealing to him. Um, and really the bigger the bigger issue here is what's all of this mean? So that's what that's what we're through. That's what that's what we're gonna primarily concerned with. Is uh, what is this vision? So he um, heavens open, right? Uh, something like a sheet descends, let down by its four corners, um, and you have all these different kinds of animals there on the back of the sheet. There's a little picture uh, of a guy named David Martin, right? Yeah, even a horse. <laughs> we don't. We don't. Some people do. So, um, yeah, this is just again a. Um, it's black and white. It's a. Uh, uh, this sketching again that goes back uh, three hundred some odd years. Right? Of this vision. Uh, so. Um, yeah, so something like the sheet descends, it's led down by its four corners, and you have all kinds of animals that are there, um, and reptiles and birds of the air, right? So we have all these different kinds, and there comes a voice to it, and rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Um, and what is Peter's response? No, yeah, no way. I mean, surely not. Of course, I can't do that. I've never, right? I'm a good Jew. I've never eaten anything outside of um, what's kosher, right? Of, of the dietary laws that are laid out in the New Testament. Of the clean and the unclean animals and that sort of thing, right? And um, the voice comes to him again, now a second time, and what does it say? 
Well, oh, well, well, you said first, right? Rise, Peter, kill and eat. So go ahead. Get up and do this. What's after that? He says, no, no, no. What is... What is right. What God has made clean, don't call common. Okay? When did he make it clean? When did well, that we'll get it in Mark. Okay. We'll get there. Okay. Huh? Didn't he declare it in Mark? I, I'm sorry. In Mark, didn't... Jesus declared that all things were clean. Now. All things were clean. Yeah. So, um, okay. <laughs> is, there, is, is there any record that Peter did eat other yes. things after that? Yes. So it's gonna as we go throughout, we're gonna we'll hear more about this is gonna come up two more times because this is gonna cause some controversy. So yes, I mean this is tied into a much bigger thing. So. The, the point of this is, and what we're going to see, so this happens three times as well, because God likes threes. Right? Um, this isn't just about food. Right? This is also about, and primarily about people. Okay? But also this distinction on what is holy, and what's common, right? And what's clean, and what's unclean. So, we do have, so Rob mentioned, you know, there's a passage in Mark, there is, and I, and I think there's a parallel, probably, at least in Matthew or Luke, one of the, one of the others. But, um, I mean, Jesus is, he, he talks about, you know, what goes into the body isn't what makes a person unclean, but it's what comes out, right? Um, and what comes out of the heart, right? That that... Um, so, you have that passage that talks about this, but this goes as well to, to so much of Jesus' ministry, as well as kind of what's going on, what has already happened in Acts, and what's going to happen in Acts, in regards to the Gentiles, but also in connection with people that are clean and unclean, and that sort of thing. So, where's Peter again? Who is he staying with? The Roman. Well, he's not with the Roman yet. He's, un he's with Simon the Tanner, who's unclean. Yeah. Right? He's a, he has this Roman soldier who's sending people to come and, and get him to bring him back. So you have issues of, of a Gentile there, and is he clean and unclean, and what, what is he doing and not doing, and that sort of thing. You've seen in the passage, the whole reason he's in Joppa in the first place is because... Of, um, of a dead body that he went in and would have um, 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 <clears throat> would have made him unclean just by his proximity to that body right and so he, they would have he would have had to go through these ritual um, ritualistic cleansing things that, that he would have done in order to be declared clean <coughs> so you have all of this stuff. Jesus is, is, we touched on this last time too, right? Jesus does this all the time. The with Hasidic, clean and unclean do people. Do the Hasidic Jews still have to go through these kind of things? Yes. Yes, they do. Yeah. So, um, she said, do the Hasidic Jews still go through all these? Um, yes, very much so. The, um, so and the Hasidic the Hasidic Jews, so the ones kind of you normal, uh, the traditional, you know, they'll wear the kind of traditional garb and have the hair. Um, I don't forget what that's called. Um, anyway, but um, those basically are Pharisees. Okay? Pharisaical Judaism is what survived. Okay? And up until recent, you know, last hundred ish years, like in a lot of places, then you started to have. Um, liberal divisions and breaks, right? So now you have liberal Jews, you have the, the more, but the more conservative, traditional, we're actually going to follow what it says, those are Pharisees, or the kind of the descendants of the Pharisees, okay? So, yes, they still do this, um, very much so, it's a big deal. A um, little bit of a sidetrack. My older brother's an ER doctor, and he did his residency. He went to school at the University of Pennsylvania. So downtown Philadelphia, uh, bad part of town is where he was. Uh, so well, medical school, yeah, that is, is where he was. Yeah. So he's in the medical school um, at this. It's a hospital in the university hospital. And one of his best friends, 
um, was an Orthodox Jew. Um, who Philadelphia was as far west as this young man had ever gone. Wow. Okay. So that's, that's not very far west. Right? So he hadn't ever been farther west than that. Well, they go out and they, they have their, um, like, a six month um, internship that they do, and they go to Gallup, New Mexico. <laughs> right next to the Navajo Reservation. Right? Um, and so my brother goes and his friend, the Orthodox Jew, goes. A um, little bit of a culture shock right, for this guy as well. So you imagine, I mean, he lived up, he lived his entire life in the Northeast, always in big cities. Um, and now he goes to this, this little town of Gallup. Right. So they get into, they go and they rent the apartment before they can go in. They had um, about three days of different rituals that he had to do to, clean, to cleanse everything from um, the whole structure, right, to the oven <laughs> and the stove. Well, you, you can't, if, if unclean food was cooked in, in a place, in this place, you have two options either you can throw it out and get a brand new one, or there are, there are rituals you can do to kind of go to it. So there's a physical thing, but there's also um, all the spiritual stuff. And they often have separate refrigerators to make things uh -huh. easier for them, the cleaning area. They'll have like, almost like two kitchens in their kitchen, sometimes yeah. even three. Yeah. So it was quite the, so for basically for six months, my brother followed the kosher diet, <laughs> which he says wasn't bad. Um, I mean, there's still a lot of things like can eat. So, I mean, it's not bad, it's just you're not used to it, and certain, certain things you got to do, and where you get your food from, and, and that sort of thing, too, right? That must have been so, hard just to find that kind of food in California. I know. Oh, yeah. That's what I was So, anyway, this kind of stuff, it's still a big deal. I mean, here's a guy who's now, um, who's, you know, way, way, way far away from his family and anywhere he'd ever been before. That nobody, I mean, my brother probably wouldn't have told anybody if the guy would have cheated a little bit. Yeah. Right? But he did. Um, because this stuff's a big deal. Uh, he did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, so you have a bunch of Navajos going, like, what's this guy? <laughs> you know, they've never seen anybody like that before either. So, anyway. Um, yes, this is still this is still a big deal for the Pharisees in particular. Um, and those that are kind of the descendants of the Pharisees on, on how all this goes. But... You know, Jesus spends a lot of his ministry dealing with, with what is clean and unclean, who is clean and unclean, and that sort of thing. And he does talk a little bit about this. Now you also have, right here, I mean, you have this section where, um, where God tells Peter, kill and eat. Okay? And Peter, again, being a good, devout, um, you know, Jewish upbringing, even though he believes in Jesus, and that Jesus is the Son of God, goes can't do that, right? That's against the rules. And I and everybody knows we can't do that. Um, but then God clarifies, and again, not just once, but three times. Now. What God has made clean, do not call uncommon, right? So I'm if, I, if I'm God, and I'm telling you this is okay to do, it's okay to do it. <laughs> right? So, yeah. 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 Now, I think this is an interesting note too. Just kind of a side note as well. In my Bible, these words here are printed in red. So, but it doesn't. Well, because so it's the words of Jesus are in red. So the translators here are taking this, this as being not just God in general or God the Father speaking but or the Spirit, but Jesus speaking to people. Well, they are one. Okay. I mean, they are one. Uh, so um, just, that's just a you note. Know, it doesn't say in the text, Jesus spoke to Peter and said this. 
but um, I think this is I mean, this is a very real possibility, right? That that just in, in a similar way as to when Jesus stops Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus and talks to him there, that Jesus is that is talking to Peter here as well, right? And Peter doesn't seem to be um, notice Peter doesn't seem to be um, scared like what normally happens. It's just he hears this. I, um, Rise, kill, and eat. Peter says, no, by, by no means, Lord. By taking, by declaring all food is, is clean, Jesus essentially has taken away another idol. Yeah. Because at this point, that's idol worship. Yeah. You're saying, I need to do something to be saved. Yeah. Yes. And this is going to... So this is going to be a, a symptom of the bigger problem that's going to arise as we go throughout this uh, with the, in regards to the Gentiles. And kind of, we've already touched on this a little bit, but in order then to be a real Christian, do I have to become Jewish? Right? I mean, that's the question that they're now being, that this is all kind of um, addressing, and that they're going to be faced with again, right? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to follow the diet? Do they have to do um, follow all of the, the 613 extra commandments that the Pharisees created so you don't break the ten? But you also then are starting to get to this issue of really the issue of the law. How do we treat the law? Right? What is it? Where does it come from? And that's and what's the purpose? Right? So we do have, um, we typically talk about three different categories of the law. Okay. So easy ones like the moral law. Okay, so Ten Commandments, right? The law that that says don't do this, but do this, right? In in regards to morality, to ethics. You also have the ceremonial law. So this is wrapped up into the worship, the worship life, right? Um, so when you go, what kind of um, sacrifices do you bring? Right. When do you do this sort of thing? How is, you know, do you have to go to the temple? What can you do there? What can you do in a synagogue? All of that kind of stuff. Right. So you have those kinds of laws that kind of um, revolve around um, the worship and spiritual life. And then you have another category of law as well that's, that are kind of the nationalistic laws. Right? So that as if you're living in this country of Israel, these are the laws that are unique to this country as, um, as at that time in that place. So, you know, in our, our thinking, that would be I mean, just the, the governmental laws that we find. You know, there's a speed limit here. Well, if you go to a different place or a different country, the speed limits could be different. Um, and that's, is one right and the other wrong? Well, not necessarily, right? I mean, it's, you have, Whoever's kind of in charge or the ones that gets to set for these kind of laws. So when Jesus now comes and he says, I've come um, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, now you start to have these questions arise. So which, which ones do we have? What do we have to do? If we believe that we're saved by faith and it's all by grace and not by works, so what role then does the law have in our lives? So a good answer to that is Romans. I mean, Paul spends a ton of time in the Romans dealing with Jewish Christian Romans, you know, people who live in Rome, that are struggling with this sort of issue, right? So, um, since I'm free from this, um, you know, now does the law no longer apply, you know, or should, should, sin, um, should sin abound so that grace may abound even more? And Paul's like, no, that's not what this means at all, right? Your freedom in the gospel doesn't now mean you get to go and do whatever you want. Right? So Paul in Romans speaks about this a lot. Galatians speaks about this a lot, in particular to the Judaizers, those that are saying, hey, you Gentiles have to become like us Jews. And not just like us Jews, but us Jews here and now living in this nationalistic um, country at the time. So if the Pharisees came forward then, um, how did they deal with 
the Sadducees and their non belief in life after death. But some of them came forward in this group. There were still conflicts going on inside, or did they just kind of get left behind? Yeah, there were. I mean, for the most part, they all followed the diet. I mean, the dietary laws and that, because all that stuff's laid out in Leviticus mm -hmm. and Deuteronomy. And so there was there was general agreement on that kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, just like in um, there was a lot of um, internal arguments, just like there are today um, in Judaism mm -hmm. and in Christianity. And as they mixed with the Christians, I would think that the Pharisees' outlook at least was lining up with Christians and the fact that there is life after death, whereas mixing Sadducees in there, they, they'd be further apart from Christians. Well, yeah, um, yeah I mean, in that specific respect, uh -huh. on the, um, you know, the resurrection and, and eternal life and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So that wasn't as much of a stumbling block for the Pharisees as it was for the Sadducees. For the Sadducees. Yeah. But the Pharisees, or the Sadducees got some things that the Pharisees didn't. So I know. So it just kind of depends on, yeah. on the topic. Just like now, right? <laughs> right? So, let's keep going. <laughs> so, in verse 17. Um, so, I want to go through uh, verse 17 um, through um, uh, 23a. Okay, so, and then we'll talk about that and we'll finish up the section. So, verse 17. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, the old men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house to the gate and called out, they asked whether Simon, who was called Peter, was walking. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said, And behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. Okay? So, Peter now is sitting there pondering the vision. What he's thinking, okay? What, what does all this mean? Okay? And he's, um, he's perplexed as to what this is going on. And that's right when the people from Cornelius show up. Right? So they come, they find a place, and while he's, Peter is going, what, what in the world just happened? Right? What does all of this stuff mean? Then you have the Holy Spirit again speaks, telling Peter, right? Behold, three men are looking for you. Right? Um, rise, go down, and accompany them without hesitation for what? Who sent them? I, right? So the Spirit says, for I have sent them. Right? Not Cornelius who sent them. But I have sent them. Okay? So, we see now the Holy Spirit work, you know, this confirms as well what, what Cornelius saw and what's going on in his life right now. And that he is being guided and directed by the Holy Spirit as well. So it confirms that. And that's the assurance for Peter. This guy's legitimate. He's being led and directed by me. Um, so go with him. Okay? So he goes down and says, I, you know, I'm the man that you're looking for. You know, what's the reason for your coming? Why are you here? And they tell him. Right, that Cornelius is in turn. I'm an upright, God-fearing man who's well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. Right? Um, so uh, here's a Gentile who's respected by the Jews, who believes in God, who's being directed by the Spirit and by um, an angel of the Lord um, to send us so that you would come back. So Peter, does he have to think about it much? No. He says, okay, fine. He invites them in. Again, you know, this is... A little afternoon, right? When all of this is happening, because that's when he was praying. So it's a little afternoon. He invites them in to be his guests. Now, the rest of that verse, 23, the next day he rose and went away with them. Right? And some of the brothers from Joppa. <coughs> so they stayed there just overnight, probably because the day is far enough along. They say, let's you know, come on in, get some rest. First thing in the morning, we'll head on out. Not just them, but you have some of the brothers 
right? So of some other believers from Joppa who are now going with them. So let's keep going. Verse 24 um, through verse 33. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them. And they called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with him, or to visit anyone in another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them, Why have you sent me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, the man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. So I send for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Okay. So, they go to Caesarea, Cornelius is waiting for them. Right. What does he do right off the, when Peter comes in? Worships them. Yeah. Right. So he meets him and he falls down and worships him. Right. Why do you think he would do that? Okay, because he's a man of God. Okay. Well, God gave him that vision. Okay, and so God gave him the vision here. As well, so um, so he he does this, and what's Peter say? Yeah, yeah. yeah. get off! Right. I'm just a man. I don't. I'm not the one you worship. Right. Get up! Okay. Um, I think how tempting it would have been to for Peter or some of or Paul and some of these others to be worshipped. Yeah. You know, it would have been very tempting because that's the ego thing. Right. But they never did. Yeah, absolutely. And especially, I mean, if these guys know, you know, or at least have heard, hey, you know, um, Peter just raised somebody from the dead. Yeah. Made a paralyzed man walk. Yeah. Right? Everybody, everybody in the whole area is talking about him. Yeah. Right? I mean, and, and then to have the guy come right into your home yeah. like this. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you can see, I think it's easy to see how Cornelius could do that. But the temptation, as well, for these guys, for Peter, for, for Paul later on, and for some others, to say, hey, you know, I kind of like this attention. I would think seeing the things that they've seen, Well, and I think, that, I think that's why. I think that's why I don't think it's I don't think it's just because it's there's a, a natural innate humi humility in and of themselves, but I think it's because now of all these things that they've seen and heard, um, all these things that have happened, as well as the Holy Spirit who's been with them guiding and and Peter, you know, I mean it's it's interesting again what Peter does um, in chapter nine um, when he heals Aeneas. He says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Right. So he's not pointing it back to him. Right. Um, he tells um, with Dorcas, he just says, arise. Right. Um, and she sits up. But when you see them preaching and talking, they're always going back to saying, this is by the power of Jesus, right? who you crucified, who God raised from the dead, who is now ascended into heaven. It's by this Christ that these things are happening. And I, so, yeah, I think that, that certainly is guarding them against this kind of thing. That Jewish law is still there. Yeah, right? Because if he was claiming to be some type of deity. Yeah. Yeah. So, and certainly, I mean, all that kind of stuff probably played a, played a big role in this. So, and he, and, he, and he highlights some of this, some of these issues here, too. I think leading up to the crucifixion, the apostles and everybody along with them still had quite a bit of pride. 
yeah. and said, I'm a follower of Jesus. But I think once, just before the crucifixion and during the cru crucifixion, they were totally humbled and led to believe that I'm really not much of anything right. compared to this guy right here. And even Paul, as much pride as he had, it got beat out of them pretty fast. Yeah. And so Absolutely. Now that these guys have had a big rude awakening, I don't see pride ever coming back in. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, I think this is the importance, too, of, of Pentecost, right? The, the giving of the Holy Spirit um, among them as well. That now they're, um, that there is a marked difference between the disciples um, uh, before the crucifixion and then after when Jesus is showing himself to, to them and then you have Pentecost and now they're going out with a very different a very different attitude because um, because Christ is risen and it should be the same with us right? our attitudes should be different like this. Um, and it, unfortunately it isn't always the case but it should be the same so um couple more things here about this section is um, so Peter and Cornelius start to talk and they go they go more into the house and there's a lot of other people there right so Cornelius obviously has been telling people hey I sent for Peter he's going to come and so they gather some more people around and um, um, when Peter comes in he says something pretty significant and he says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. Right? So he's saying, you're a Gentile. You're a God-fearing Gentile. You believe in God. You know the rules. And you still invited me to come. And I still came. Right? So this is going against the grain for what, for what would have been um, lawful in, um, in that sense of the time. And then Peter goes on, but God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Okay? So, that's why back in the vision, he sees food coming down. But what is Peter's, what does Peter understand that to, to really be talking about? God's creation. God's creation. All of God's creation. Right? Including, these, including people. And Peter now is also saying, God is showing again, God is showing me I should not call any person common or unclean. And so he goes into this Gentile's house with the recognition that through faith, Cornelius is clean. Right? He's been cleansed of his sin. And so he's this is a recognition then that their faith and their unity in Christ transcends their ethnic divisions or their ethnic unity as well. Okay. So that means, right, their primary identity now is who, is who they are, is those who have been made clean by the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Not what language they speak, what area they grew up in, the color of their skin, or anything like that. Now, it's, again, it's all wrapped around Jesus. Um, and so, and Peter, he figures this out. He, he gets this. And he says, so I come without objection because I recognize God's made you clean. And, um, and then he says, so what would you send for me for? You know, now I'm here. What, what do you want? Um, I recognize that we're brothers in, in Christ. Right? Um, and so Cornelius recounts, this is what happened to me. Right? Just four days ago, um, an angel came and told me to send for you. Um, and now you're here. Right? So Cornelius doesn't really have an answer either. He's following the guidance of the Spirit. And saying, so now um, I send for you, you're here, and, and we're ready to, to hear what you have to say. Okay. So, Peter starts talking. So this next section, starting with verse 34. <laughs> Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. 
you yourselves know what happened through, throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. He put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Okay. So, um, again, this isn't the first time that we hear uh, of one of the um, one of the apostles open his mouth. That's usually in in Acts. That's um, that's uh, a signal that it's the Spirit now is speaking through the person to us. Okay. So every time that shows up, they're um, they're about to preach a sermon. Okay. So, he opens his mouth, and he says, again, starts off, I understand God shows no part partiality. Like I'm start, I get it now, or I'm starting to get it anyway. Right? Um, that, um, that the gospel isn't just for some ethnic group in a little country in this part of the world, but the gospel is for everyone, for every nation. Right? Um, and in here, uh, where it says every nation, um, that's the goim, which is the, the Hebrew word for anybody who's not Jewish. Okay? Because in, in Jewish kind of mentality, there's really only two ethnicities. You're either Jewish or you're not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so Gentile is typically how that's done. So when he says, in every nation, Right? He's saying all in all of the Gentile world, right? In every nation, in all the world, anyone who fears him and does what's right is accepted. And so anyone who believes, anyone who has this faith in God. And then he goes, so as for the word that he sent to Israel, right? So when he says to every nation, that's kind of, that could include Israel, but could also not, right? Every nation as opposed to those, you know, every non-Jewish people, that this is what God has said. There's no partiality that those who believe in Him are acceptable to Him. But for this word of peace that came to you, or that came to these Jews, remember he's talking to a Gentile, right? That he sent to Israel preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. This is just a weird thing to me, by the way, too. I don't like it. Um, or I, I chuckle. It's not that I don't like it. This is a speech. So how do you do a parenthetical statement in a speech? You know. And so it always bugs me. That I don't think there should be parentheses here. You should have maybe a comma or something. Because if Peter said, preaching good news and peace through Jesus Christ, he's the Lord of all, all right? Um, parenthetical stuff, usually like in narrative, right? It's... Um, it's insights, not, but not something that's typically spoken. So I just get a chuckle. It's not that that's wrong. I just think that's funny. Um, he is the Lord of all. Okay. Yeah, at the end of verse 36. And not all translations may do that. That's just the, the English standard. Because there are, there are parentheses in Greek. Right. Anyway. Um, he said the word that he sent to Israel... Right? Preaching this good news of peace through Jesus Christ. You yourselves have known. Right? You've heard this too. You've heard about Jesus. And then he recounts. He, he just goes through the, a basic life of Jesus. Right? Um, starting with um, Galilee after the baptism of Jesus. Going all the way. Um, he does these miracles. He does these things. And we saw it. We're eyewitnesses. To all of all of this, he dies um, by hanging on a tree again, an idiom for crucifixion. God raised him on the third day, and made him to appear, not to everybody, 
right? But, but to those who believe, to those who He chose, and over 500 is what, is what we hear at the beginning of Acts, right? Over 500 people, He eats and He drinks, showing He's not just a ghost or a figment of their imagination, but He's a real live person um, who's doing this kind of thing. And then He commands us to go and preach to the people and to testify that He's the one. And the one who's appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. So you have this emphasis here that this is that this Jesus will be the one on that last judgment, the one who will be saved and deciding this one gets gets into my heaven and this one doesn't. And that this um, then he qualifies this as well. To all to him all the prophets bear witness, right? So the Old Testament is about who? Jesus. Jesus, right? The Old Testament's about Jesus. The prophets are all talking about Jesus. You say to this, the prophets bear witness, and they bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So this isn't a new thing that Peter is just coming up with and having some delusion because he's hungry. <laughs> but he's saying even the prophets that are bearing witness about Christ and are bearing witness that this is that this really hasn't ever been confined just to an ethnic group. But it's for all who hear in this good news and who hear and believe that they will be saved, that they will have that forgiveness of sins through Jesus' name. Right? And then and as he is the one who's the judge, then that's that's what the judgment is based on, is by faith. So I'm looking at this and, and thinking about uh, about reading this earlier in the week. It almost seems to me that this is like the first church service with the beginning of a liturgy to tell you these are the gifts that God is giving to you and all you have to do is receive. You are the passive individual. They brought nothing or expected anything, but they still got the gift of God and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I mean, I certainly think it certainly has. I mean, he's, he's preaching to him. I mean, so this this certainly, um, I think, can be seen in the context of, of worship in that certainly worship and service in that kind of way. So the term is basically uh, taking the creed. Well, I, this this is actually what I was going to close it. Oh, wow. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, this is good. Uh, that means we're both sick. I like it when we when people when we're thinking the same things, right? So then that way, it's, it, uh, you know, you say, "Well, I'm not, I'm not just weird." I'm not completely off base, but somebody else is thinking the same thing. I think it shows that God could be guiding it. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, again. I mean, I don't know what everybody's thoughts are, but it kind of seems that that can happen. Well, absolutely. I mean, yeah. absolutely. I mean, so you have the angel telling Cornelius, go and send for Peter. Yeah. Peter then getting this vision, so it's no accident that he gets this vision yeah. right before he goes to the house of the Gentile. Right? And he goes, and he but says, why? the same thing. Oh, yeah. 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 Same thing. And the same thing. And, and he, even, he even tells the guy, you heard this. <laughs> right? You have already heard. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning in Galilee. Right? You've heard this. And then what he goes through basically is, is a creedal statement as well, right? That means as well, when you and I, when, when we are, are going to people who may have heard about Jesus a little bit, you know, a really good, and you're going, I, you know, the opportunities here, and I can tell somebody a little bit about my faith, but what do I talk about, what do I say? Um, the creed actually is a really good resource, right? So you could say, um, you know, well, well, I mean, whatever the situation, and you bring it around to, you know, well, this is why I believe in Jesus. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Jesus first, right? That Jesus is um, God's um, own son who was born of the Virgin Mary, right? Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, right? He did these miraculous things. And then he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and on the third day, he rose again. I mean, you even get the judgment. 
part, right? And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Um, that's in there as well. So these creed, the creed is in itself is almost an outline of the sermon and an evangelism tool, which is why we spend so much time talking about talking about that kind of stuff and trying to teach our kids this kind of stuff. And then when somebody says, okay, so you know, well, so what? And you say, well, let me tell you what this means. And that's where the explanation comes out, right? That I believe that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. He's also my Lord. Well, let me tell you what that means, right? That he's rescued me, um, you know, from sin. Um, and he's done this, and he's purchased and won me, not by any gold or silver, right? He didn't pay me, pay for something, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocence of me. So that's what the catechism is for, right? It's an evangelism so that you guys already have the words and know the words for a starting point and just tell the gospel and tell what, what um, people believe. I just quoted, the other day, I just quoted that to somebody who I, I thought might have, I thought would have recognized. And we were talking about the first article, I believe in God the Father Almighty. And I said, well, I believe that God has given me all my senses, my eyes, my ears, and all my members. Um, we're just, and the whole reason that's in my head is because we're doing it in school, right? So I, I kind of rememorate some stuff with the kids every time. Um, and so we're going through this, and I'm sitting here quoting it, and they're like, wow, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And I know you've read it before. Because you're, you know, you're a Lutheran. I know you've read it before. And they went, oh! Like, uh, been a while. Anyway, that's what this stuff's for. It's really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, right? Yeah. So, um, anyway, there's more here. So we're going we're gonna to finish up um, talking next week. We'll talk a little bit more about what Peter said to Cornelius and kind of what this goes on. And then um, what happens immediately afterwards, the Holy Spirit comes to the Gentiles. Right? And then it, we'll get into chapter 11 where Peter now tells the church about this in Jerusalem. And now you start to have more and more of this, okay, you know, this, what's the relationship between Jews and Gentiles and belief and faith in Christ? What does this look like? Right? So now, then you're going to start getting uh, these issues rising more and more. And then you're even going to get Peter and Paul butting heads over how this should look and what this should look like. Right? Uh, so. That's that's where we're going. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering if that food discussed that food argument already happened or not. That's what I was trying to that. That's what well, yeah, that, not really. Not yeah. Really. Yeah. Because the point of the, the main point of the vision is is isn't just about food, clean and unclean food, but God's creation. What God declares clean, it is clean. Whether it's food or people. That's the point. And so that's why we can eat pork, right? Is because our identity and faith in Christ isn't isn't based upon what we put in, but uh, but what Christ gives us, right? And what comes out um, as the evidence of our faith. Okay, let's say closing prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks again for gathering us here today especially for the declaration that we will get to hear once more today in church, that we are clean, that our sins are forgiven, not because of who we are, but because of the blood of Christ and His sacrifice for us. And then as clean and holy people that eagerly await His return and the judgment of the living and the dead, we pray that you grant us that, that sure and steadfast faith the eagerness to welcome Christ when he comes, and to stay awake and alive in that faith until he does. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.